It's a big pleasure to have uh, Dr. Isher Alwalia, who is the chairperson of, the, of ICRIA, which is an acronym for Indian Council for Research for International Economic Relations. Um, Dr. Alwalia is uh, no stranger to us and has uh, um, uh, worked on a number of issues of uh, huge importance to policy in, in India. And, uh, but she's primarily going to be talking about um, her latest work on uh, urbanization, and in particular, the, the way in which governance intersects with urbanization, which I'm personally very, uh, very anxious to, to hear. Um, she, you know, amongst her many, many, many significant awards and accolades are the Padma Bhushan, which is one of the uh, highest civilian awards given in India by the President of India and is a member of many associations and a member of a recently set up eminent group of people on India ASEAN, set up by the Ministry of External Affairs and the Government of India. Uh, but mostly I think of her as uh, being a, a scholar and an academic and uh, with interest and relevance to a range of issues in India. So I'm extremely pleased to, to have her here. And she has the additional task, um, 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 Monte Kalawalia, some of you know, spoke here on Friday uh, I was in New Delhi, so I could not, could not attend. But I'm told he deferred a couple of important questions to, uh, to Ishur, so we'll leave Ishur to pick up on it. So why don't you speak for a while, then we can have an informal conversation, and we're recording it for the web, so as you see fit. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Tarun. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am, first of all, I should say that I'm not an urban expert. <laughs> And I'm a mainstream economist who really has been working on issues of industrial growth, productivity, macroeconomic reforms, etc. But for the past uh, six years, uh, seven years, I really have been working on urbanization in the context of India's overall economic development. Um, today, we have uh, about 33% of our population that is urban and it is projected to increase to 40%. Uh, we have about 420 million today Indians that live in cities and towns, and this will increase to 600 million by 2031. Uh, we have about 57 cities with population of 1 million and above, and this number will increase to 87 by 2031. We have two thirds of our GDP, which is being contributed by the urban sector, and this is forecast to increase to 75% by 2031. And uh, as you know, that for the past uh, two decades, uh, India has been among the fastest growing economies. And even if you include the slowdown of the uh, last couple of years, the period from 2001 to 2015 saw a, a trend growth rate of 7.3%. Uh, and there have been periods, you know, a 10 year period there where growth average was 7.7%. So even if we assume that, you know, the economy is going to grow at 7 to 8% per annum uh, in the foreseeable future, this growth is really going to come from industry and services because agriculture uh, is likely projected to grow at about four, four and a half percent. So cities will really be the engines of growth. And even in the rapid growth phase that we have had uh, uh, in recent years, it's been the cities of uh, Bangalore, Hyderabad, um, uh, Chennai, um, Ahmedabad, Mumbai. These are the cities that have really uh, uh, been the engines of growth. And it's, uh, it's very uh, clear that these cities are bursting at the seams. And uh, we need to fix uh, the <coughs> infrastructure and service delivery of these cities. And we need to uh, uh, build more cities. We need to see that these cities expand in a planned way. So what we really need today is planned urbanization. Uh, now, what is, uh, um, uh, you know, before I go to that, a uh, very important 
uh, thing which you know may seem very obvious to people over here but somehow in India is not understood that well is that you need urbanization not only for urban development but you need planned urbanization for rejuvenating your rural sector as well. And a classic example of how a state can go down if you don't have a planned strategy of urbanization is the case of Punjab, where uh, you know Punjab had a rich agricultural base. And in 1991, when we started a, a program of deregulation and liberalization, it was really the southern states and the western states that took off to uh, uh, provide a better investment climate in which they could mm. attract investment and private sector could lead growth, whereas Punjab uh, failed to do so for whatever reasons. And from being number one uh, uh, per capita income state in the country, it's now about number seven or number eight. Mm. So, you know, un urbanization is essential at the current stage of uh, India's economic development. Hmm? Uh, in, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's important to uh, understand that uh, urban development really uh, has been the responsibility of the state government, according to our constitution. And in 1992, there was a constitutional amendment which formally recognized the third tier the city government, and uh, uh, therefore uh, asked the state governments to transfer certain functions as responsibilities of city governments. However, this uh, amendment did not uh, clearly specify how the finances were also going to be devolved to the city governments so that these mm -hmm. mandates will be funded. Mm -hmm. So you had a situation where drinking water, solid waste management, wastewater treatment, urban roads, public transport, street lights have, have now become the responsibility of city governments. But the funding uh, uh, for uh, either planning or managing all these uh, really is in the hands of the state government. The Constitution had said that you set up a State Finance Commission, and that Finance Commission will tell you how to distribute your uh, revenue uh, between yourself and the city governments. And this would be like we have had with the Central Finance Commission. Uh, but this actually has not happened. And even in states where they've set up a State Finance Commission, uh, the devolution has been very, very little. So that's the reality. Now, um, I was invited to chair a, what they call a high-powered expert committee on urban infrastructure and service delivery in 2008. And at that time, when we uh, uh, looked at evidence on the state of service delivery, there was very little documented evidence. And of course, there was a great deal of uh, 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 evidence visible. You just have to visit a city to see the poor state of service delivery, but you know, it was not uh, uh, documented. Uh, it was only in 2008 for the first time that the government of India even put out the norms of service delivery, that you should have continuous water supply from mm -hmm. a safe source, from a, a piped network, um, 24-7, and even at that point, like when they said all solid waste must be collected and transported 20 kilometers away from the city and then processed and uh, disposed of, for the f these norms were put out for the first time in, in uh, 2008, and they've really been observed more in the breach. And uh, so that's the state of uh, uh, service delivery that we have. In all of this, there is uh, one very uh, uh, important development that happened, and that was in 2005, when the government of India uh, launched something called a Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission. So it was a national mission 
uh, with a pot of money, uh, 100,000 crores of rupees. And the idea was that the state government uh, will come to the government of India with a specific project uh, identified in a city. And that project must come together with a city development plan. And as uh, 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 the two governments come to the government of India asking for funding to bridge this infrastructure deficit, the government of India will put 60% of the funding and the remaining 2020 uh, will be done by the other two levels of government. Uh, this funding was to be made available on a conditional basis. There was a set of reforms uh, that were mandatory, which the city government had to uh, uh, commit to and the state government had to commit to. Now, what happened, what they were expecting was that in the course of identifying urban infrastructure deficit and specific projects that the three governments together will come and fund, um, they, will be, they will be able to atta attract a lot of private funding. Because 100 crores, uh, 100,000 crores is, was the total project funding of which 60,000 crores the government of India will put. But they expected that much more will come from the private sector. And uh, in fact, on the ground, you may see the result of more funding. But as it turned out, uh, because the reform conditionality could not be enforced, uh, the reform conditionality was very broad. And the, the funding was actually project-based. So you could be a great project leader, you do everything right, and your project is going along well, come your second installment or your third installment, and uh, the government of India says, but the property taxes have been reduced by the state government, you know, which was part of the commitment that they would not do, or you have not taken some e-governance measures, or uh, your accounts are not on finance uh, accrual basis, which you had agreed to, so the next allotment will not come. Now, at that point, it became a kind of you know playing of games where the state government would like to show up the government of India for not funding. If the government of India chose to ignore uh, 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 this phenomenon and fund uh, uh, the project, then there was a question of moral hazard. You know, why would other city governments and state governments do these reforms? So actually, the reforms that took place were uh, much uh, 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 less than what was expected. So private funding didn't come much. But even on the basis of what they were trying to do with this little bit of money, um, what the urban sector saw and what the local government saw was uh, what appeared to them like big money from their perspective. Now, these were only in a limited number of cities. You know, there were 65 cities in which JNN and uh, uh, was uh, applicable. And then there were a lot of small and medium towns where this program also took place. But uh, there were, at that stage, uh, what uh, I decided to do as a chair of this committee was to visit a whole lot of these projects. Uh, the ones which I was told were doing better, were doing well, to see what was happening on the ground. And uh, um, what this book, Transforming Our Cities, has are 40 such case studies. And these are in the areas of, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that, and these are cases where uh, when you actually went and saw what was happening on the ground, you found that funding was only a part of the, uh, uh, you know, what was needed. Uh, what really made a difference in uh, getting things done was uh, uh, basically an enabling environment provided by the state government. Uh, uh, better financial devolution, holding the hands of a local government when they needed capacity to plan and manage, and uh, going through with legislative reforms where they felt that was needed. Uh, there were a couple of states where you had uh, uh, legislative uh, amendments to accommodate public-private partnership. Um, the town planning schemes 
for uh, uh, land pooling, uh, which were working very well in Gujarat uh, because they had amended their municipal act, was then followed in Maharashtra where they amended their act and tried to do the same thing. So wherever you had an enabling environment provided by the state government, and where the local governments were relatively less financially weak, you found that uh, you know, it did uh, uh, lead to better outcomes on the ground. So um, there is a self-selection bias in the mm -hmm. cases that I report here, because that mm -hmm. was the purpose. And uh, the, you know, um, when you go and you uh, uh, speak in India and you say that you know China has done such and such or Singapore has done that or you know there's always this thing but you know it can't work within our system so what I was trying to do was to look at the cases and show uh, how even under our political and economic constraints you can actually bring about major transformations in uh, uh, the state of our cities and the question is how to scale it up and what are the sort of cross-cutting factors, you know, which uh, make a difference. And here maybe what I should do is just give you a little sense of um, um, the examples so you get, uh, you know, what I'm uh, talking about. Um, the, uh, take the case of Bangalore or Pimpri Chinchwad, which mm -hmm. is a small city, a twin city of Pune. Uh, in these two cities, uh, you had uh, uh, GIS-based uh, mapping of the properties, and then you had a self-assessment uh, scheme for property taxes, and you could actually pay your property taxes online, and a whole range of you know things that they had done. And in 2002, uh, Bangalore was collecting 38% of the demand mm. for property taxes. In 2013, they said increased to 80%. In Pimpri Chinchwad in Maharashtra, the property uh, tax collection increased 15-fold in three years from 2 crores in 2010 to 27 crores mm. in 2013. Now, there are a whole lot of cities and states in which they have done GIS-based mapping. Even Delhi has had GIS-based mapping. But what they do is, you see, they stop with that. You, you do this induction of technology, you get the map. Then that map has to be, you know, you have to look at it against your register of properties and all the follow-up that has to be done and the institutional kind of connect to go from there and how you link that with your revenue department. Uh, um, you know, all those things are missing. Same thing with e-governance. You know, you'll have a whole lot of cities that have invested, so to speak, in e-governance because they've bought computers, maybe somewhere mm -hmm. they've even done the training. But um, actually, when it comes to uh, um, a major significant increase in service delivery, there are a handful of uh, uh, cities. Uh, um, a very, very good city for uh, G2C uh, um, interface is Kalyan Dumbivli, which is one of the cities outside of Mumbai, where you can get, uh, you know, the, where the property tax assessment time was brought down from 110 days mm -hmm. in 2007 to 21 days in 2013. And when I visited their civic center, actually it, it, it was really very pleasant. You saw somebody standing there with a stack of money and I asked him what he was doing. He was making his property tax payment, mm. you know, uh, 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 come to that place online. Now, uh, Surat is a city which has used technology. Mm. First they have done the, you know, this is a city which is, as you know, on the banks of River Tapi and very susceptible to floods because they have a <coughs> dam, you know, which uh, uh, it being a drought area, they store a lot of water and come monsoon and if the rains are too much, they have to release the water. Mm -hmm. And in 2006, you know, 80% of the city was inundated uh, uh, with water and they had plague which, was, which made headlines, you know, all over the world. In 2013, 
they released about the same amount of mm. water they, that they had to in 2006, but now they had set up systems for, uh, first they had uh, done a lot of basic infrastructure work, separating storm water drains from uh, 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 your sewers, by covering the whole area with, with a sewerage network, doing wastewater treatment and all of those things. And then on top of that, they have a climate change resilience uh, uh, trust in which they have stakeholders, private, public sector, civil society, everything. And uh, now they have a, a way in which they can, uh, uh, with the meteorological department's help, they can predict 48 hours in advance uh, uh, what uh, weather's uh, going to be like. And so they, ca they calculate water releases and then they send SMSs to people. So, you know, uh, this time there was absolutely no damage in 2013. So it's not rocket science, you know, uh, uh, to bring these things about. But what is involved is really cooperation of different government departments, use of technology, um, transparency, and, you know, uh, 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 these kinds of things. Uh, maybe I'll give you one or two other. Mm. Yeah. Uh, one very interesting example mm. is that of Alandur. Now, this is when people tell me that um, in India, politicians don't let you do anything. Now, in Alandur, which is a small town outside of uh, Chennai in the 1990s when there was uh, tremendous growth and development uh, in Chennai, um, people could not afford to buy real estate in the city, so they went and located themselves in, in Alandur. And in the year 2000, Alandur had, um, in 2002, it had zero underground sewerage network. And they had a very dynamic mayor who actually uh, went to the World Bank and said, I want to get 100% sewerage and can you help? So the World Bank prepared a pre-feasibility study and uh, then offered to even give 50% of the funding as loans at 16% interest. And uh, the only condition they had was that there must be public deposits mm. from the community, uh, ranging from 1,000 rupees to 5,000 rupees. Now, this man came back and he campaigned heavily to get uh, public deposits. And he had to get about uh, 2.3 or 3.2 crore, uh, uh, which he had committed. But actually, he ended up getting 3.4 is what he, he was supposed to get. He got 12.4 crores of rupees from the public, at which point the government of Tamil Nadu said that, look, we will put in the, the remaining amount. 50% was coming from the government of India, and he, they needed another 4 crores. So the Tamil Nadu Urban Development Fund uh, arrange that uh, financing and in three years from 2002 to 2005 you went from a zero underground sewage network to 100% uh, and two sewage treatment plants of 12 MLD capacity. The residents agreed to pay user charges to cover costs of operation and management and now where do the politicians uh, mm. come in? Uh, he was supposed to be very close to the DMK chief. Mm. And by the time it was, uh, this project had to be commissioned, uh, the DMK had lost, and it was uh, uh, Jai Lalita who was the chief minister. And everybody told him that uh, forget about getting your project commissioned, I mean, inauguration by the chief minister. But he said, no, I'm going to go and tell her exactly what we did, and let's see. And he went. And he told her this was public's project, and uh, he would like her to come and inaugurate, and she did. So you see, you need innovation to <laughs> uh, uh, bypass kind of you know standard obstacles to these things. So that's uh, one example. Did other it, cities take a lesson from that? Sorry, haven't you see? This is the <laughs> uh, actually you know this is the problem. I'll tell you there are there are two two problems that we have. Uh, in India. One is that our uh, polity is really fixated on the rural sector. Uh, the impression that they have created and that they carry in their minds is that India lives in its villages, even though more and more of India is moving to towns. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so much so that even when our census tells us that between 2001 and 2011, there are 2,500 areas which should now be called towns because they meet the definition of a town. They have population of 5,000 and above. They have 75% of their population engaged in non-agricultural activity. And they have a density uh, uh, definition. You know, they meet these, and therefore, uh, these should be towns. But they become towns when the state government notifies <coughs> that they are towns. And it's when the state government notifies that they are towns that they are then entitled to a statutory city government. Mm. So the problem is, earlier on I talked about financial devolution, mm. but there's also empowerment of the local governments. You know, in a, uh, we've got some sort of incomplete empowerment mm. uh, through the constitutional amendment, but today the state governments, which are very powerful and feel terribly empowered, so much so that they want to sit at the high table with the Prime Minister and determine the foreign policy of India. Mamta Banerjee wants to determine what we will do vis-a-vis -vis Bangladesh. And there are other uh, uh, state chief ministers who have similar ambition. So same state governments, you know, which have gained in our federal sort of power systems between 1991 and today, they are unwilling to leave an inch for the city governments. If there are local councillors who do very well, the uh, uh, state legislator feels insecure and wants to pull them down. So, and yet we have these agglomerations coming up and if we are going to have growth in the years to come, we need urban infrastructure. And in these areas, I mean, the Chief Minister of Bihar told me that when I go and tell my vill village panchayat that I want to declare you as a nagar panchayat, uh, um, local government for a city. They tell me, no, please don't do that because there is more money in being rural <laughs> than yes. in being urban. So, you know, there is, uh, uh, what you have is really this setup which constrains uh, 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 the um, urban uh, uh, development. So that is one. The second thing I'd like to, while we are on this subject, is that, you know, when the city governments are dependent even to pay their salaries on mm. state government, hmm, and they don't have the autonomy to levy user charges mm. to cover costs, they are only recipient of property tax collection, but the rates and exemptions are set by the state government. And come an election, and the state government may decide to either cut the property tax rate or at least exempt a whole lot of properties from paying property taxes. So if you are a municipal commissioner, your budget is blown overnight. So that is the you know that is one level uh, uh, of you know institutional, um, uh, let's say, clarity uh, uh, in responsibilities that we need. The second is we need transparency in governance. And what this uh, uh, book shows, what the case studies show, is that where there is demand for good governance and people demand transparency and accountability, uh, as in, you know, uh, cities of, uh, whether you talk of Rajkot, Ahmedabad, uh, or Mysore, um, uh, you know, these are typically second tier cities where this <coughs> process is faster you actually end up, you know, getting a response from the government. But uh, when it comes to scaling up, the politics comes in and obfuscates the issues. Um, and the fact that uh, the authority is not really clearly defined makes it easier for them to do that. There's one other point that I want to make, and then maybe I'll stop for uh, discussion. And that is that, you know, in our present stage of development, I've only talked of mm. service delivery. And I mean, I, I should mention that Malkapur, a town of 40,000 in Maharashtra, today has continuous water supply 24 7. And every citizen there pays user charge to cover cost. And they pay more than what I pay for water in Delhi. 
Yeah. Uh, so it's happening. And uh, Amravati is another town, a somewhat larger town, 150,000. That's also, it's not fully uh, covered, but two thirds of their population is covered by continuous water supply. So there are, you know, cases in wastewater treatment, Surat and Mumbai have done extremely well. But on average in Indian cities, the sewage that is treated is about 15%. And, uh, uh, and these are areas which are immensely important for public health. And I think uh, we actually, you know, we used to, uh, uh, when people would come and talk to us about sustainability, we would s sort of uh, uh, react uh, in a confrontational manner saying you guys have messed up the earth and now you want us to do it right. But today when you talk to people about what is happening with wastewater, with solid waste management um, and what is happening to our air quality with the uh, poor quantity and quality of public transport, with our energy pricing, which encourages the use of diesel, even for cars, uh, people are more likely to respond because they see the threat to their health. From uh, uh, So I think that consciousness is coming because some of the, um, uh, you know, like the air quality index in Delhi is uh, really horrendous. I mean, it's, it's so bad that people are buying air purifiers for their homes. So I think, you know, we've come to a stage, like in Beijing, everybody used to talk of air quality and they mm. started working. And so I hope that we would also peak very soon because it's getting to a stage where, you know, it cannot continue like this. So one is that. The second is the metropolitan and regional development uh, 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 needs of urbanization because we need to develop clusters, we need to foster agglomeration economies. So we need to connect uh, cities with other cities, cities with villages, and nobody is doing the thinking for metropolitan and regional development. I mean, we have uh, institutions called metropolitan mm -hmm. pol uh, planning committees, but they have no authority. So one is to do service delivery, and even for service delivery, I mean, I was in Tokyo two weeks ago, and you have the Metropolitan Government of Tokyo, which has an incineration plant, which caters to the needs of solid waste management of mm. Tokyo and 22 other municipalities around mm. uh, Tokyo. So, you know, we can't have each individual uh, uh, municipal government. So basically, the state government will have to play a very major role in even organizing service delivery and in empowering and uh, enabling their uh, uh, local governments do. But the government of India will have to play a strategic role in regional and metropolitan connectivity mm -hmm. and in nudging the state and the local governments to, to do the uh, right thing. Now, you know, the prime minister has spoken of clean India mm -hmm. and he's talked about smart cities. Um, and they are also talking about some variant of the JNNURM that they are going to come up with. But you know, it's um, the clean India is being interpreted by many politicians as uh, you know, sweeping your streets and building toilets. So you know, you don't have open defecation. But the fact that you need a lot of back end integration, if you want clean India, is not fully understood. And I think we, we don't have any concept paper. We don't have any mm. preparation. And this is not going to be delivered by the government of India. This will have to be delivered by the state government. So they must come on board. And even these concepts need to be spelt out at the operational level. So that is one. The other, you know, where somehow smart cities have excited much more interest than Clean India. I'm really surprised. I mean, when I heard about Clean India, I was so happy. I thought now they'll talk of solid waste management. Nobody is doing that. But smart cities, I mean, everyone is for, I mean, who is not for smartness? I want to be smart. But you know, uh, smart, but you see, smart infrastructure will not give us smart cities. and. The Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore 
was visiting Delhi and I asked him mm -hmm. this question. I said, you know, I want to understand because he also endorsed, as I also endorse, you know, smart cities. Uh, he said it's very good that the government is coming up with this idea of 100 smart cities. So I said to him, I said, you know, I really would like you to tell me what you understand uh, uh, to be a smart city. And he said to me, smart city is a city in which people demand good governance and the government, with the help of better administration, high technology, mm -hmm. is able to deliver uh, services in a transparent and accountable manner. So you need smart people, you need smart leadership, you need smart institutions along with smart infrastructure to deliver smart cities. So I think, let mm -hmm. me stop with that and then we can that's great. That's a lot of food for thought. So um, shall we just open it up? We have a manageable crowd here, so we can just have a conversation fairly informally. One of my questions and queries and is that always I've wondered that uh, why don't we have you know, a five-year term for the mayor uh, you know, instead of one year? For example, Delhi's mayor is elected for one year. Mm. So do you think this is a problem of what Partha Chatterjee calls political society or I mean you gave us the example of DMK's chief and Jay Lalitha and she comes and inaugurate but I think it's far more than that. Thank you. Okay. Would you, you like want to yeah, uh, collect a few? In the okay, for sure. Um, uh, Ashu, just, uh, you can just pass Mayor them. Mayor Delhi is elected for one year. Uh, I, I just learned that myself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it might depend on the, on on what state you're in, I think. This is not a centrally administered matter. Uh, it's possible that some other cities also, also have mayors only one year, but it's it's also possible that other, that in some states that's not true, right? Yeah, state but it's actually not as important state as you make. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an answer, yeah. Ashutosh Varshne, uh, Director, Brown India Initiative, and, uh, and Professor of Political Science there. Um, thank you, Ishar. Um, you identified the, the basic um, structural problem uh, in India's urbanization, which is that even if two-thirds of the national income comes from, our, uh, from cities, um, uh, the, wa the rural weight in India's electoral universe is demographically 68%. But because rural India votes more than urban India, or has been for the last 20 years, effectively the weight is 75 percent. So mm -hmm. governments are governments are, for all practical purposes, made one made in rural India. So that's the site of political power, whereas the site of economic power is the city. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, now, there are a, a few things that follow from this. Uh, if this logic is correct. Uh, then the, the examples of uh, the remarkable changes you witnessed should most likely come from, and correct me if that statement is wrong, most, most of them should come from the most urbanized states of India. Mm -hmm. Because state mm -hmm. is critical here, right? Yeah. So Gujarat is 43%, Maharashtra is 45%, Kerala is 48%, Tamil Nadu is 48.4%. Uh, other than the smaller ones, Chandigarh is 97 percent, Delhi oh. 97, 95 percent, 96 percent, and some northeastern oh. states are. Oh. Uh, but of the bigger states of India, these four are, are, are the most urbanized. So if the political argument is correct, the examples that you cited of urban transformation or transformation of urban services, are they mostly cities from these states? Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. question number one. Mm -hmm. Um, question, uh, point number two, um, I think uh, the uh, focus on Singapore mm -hmm. in India's urban discussion is entirely flawed. Mm -hmm. Singapore did not have a peasantry. Mm -hmm. Singapore actually is, is, because it was a trading town, did not have a peasantry, did not have to deal with the countryside. Its pro urban problems are of a very different nature altogether. Mm -hmm. Um, mo m more interesting uh, um, 
comparisons could be drawn historically either from the United States of America at the turn of the century or England at the turn of the century, a, a little before, um, etc., or Japan around 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Now, um, if we do that, then we find something interesting. Since I've been also now st I'm studying cities, uh, I, was, I was struck by uh, presentations in my seminar at Brown where uh, those who study um, urbanization historically in, in, in UK report that London didn't have piped water mm. yeah. for all mm. residents mm. until 1904. Mm. Paris did not have piped water for all Parisians mm. until 1931. Mm. Mm. America, it, it turns out, had a lead over Europe on, on provision of piped water to all its residents. So uh, Boston, uh, Philadelphia is 1824, Boston is 1842, New York is 18. It's a very interesting puzzle why mm -hmm. America is able to provide piped water uh, or, or uh, safe water to all its citizens in some cities, whereas Europe is behind. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the answer is, but, um, but if we look at, and Tokyo, uh, Ezra Vogel, who teaches here, I remember uh, as a graduate student here at MIT going to his seminar where he, dis where he d uh, opened the discussion with his first visit to Tokyo as a student, mm. which was 1951 or 52, where he, where he said every morning you had to sh shut your nose. Mm. The sanitation was so bad in much of, much of Tokyo. Mm. Of course, in the next 15 years, Tokyo was transformed, and so was Japan. Right? Mm. So this, if we, if, we, if we comparativize the Indian case, so historicize the Indian case, the interesting intellectual question is, at what point do, you, do we think in, uh, we, we will, in India, reach an inflection point, mm -hmm. right? Now, the predicted urban population in 2031 by McKinsey is, is 40%. Mm -hmm. uh, the pre 2039, I think, yeah. 2031, 2031 is 40%. Yeah. And the predicted urban population by CPR, Partho Mukhopadhyay, et cetera, would be, uh, uh, is 40% by 2025, if not sooner, because they, they're counting urban differently. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, so at what point do we think the, the political economy yeah. will generate an inflection point to the, to, uh, of a kind where state governments would have to start looking after the city. At this point, they will not. Unless in UP, which is 20, 22%, 23% urban only, there is no incentive for politicians and political parties to look after the cities. Bihar is 21%, I think. No, 20%. So there is absolutely no political incentive for state governments to look after Patna. Right? Not that villages are looked after very, very, very well, but there will be more emphasis in, in, in politics on rural India as has been. So are you, do you think in another 10 years we will begin to see the infle in that inflection point uh, yeah. or not? So do you want to yeah, address these I think two, let me the answer these two. Right. This one and then we can now, um, you know, uh, one question is that of the term of the mayor. The mm. other is whether mayors are elected or not elected. Hmm? Mm. The third is whether they are directly elected or mm. indirectly elected. We have all the systems. In different states, you have different systems. Mm. But I remember when I was writing a piece for the Urban Age Conference on urban governance. and. I find McKinsey and company all the time talking about the importance of directly elected mayors. So I ended up sort of picking up the phone and, and talking to two or three municipal commissioners whom I respect enormously. I've been working with them for the last five, six years. And what the wisdom that I got from them, and I completely subscribe to that, is that when you don't have a city government which is empowered what good is it to even directly elect a mayor for five years? Now, Tamil Nadu has direct election of mayors. Mm -hmm. And the, Tamil Nadu, uh, the Chennai mayor uh, stood up at a uh, uh, seminar where I was addressing at the World City Summit in Singapore to say to me, but I am not authorized to deliver water to Chennai. So how do you expect me to function? Water is being delivered by the... Chennai 
metro water board. So, first you know you have not transferred even the functions, then you do not have finances. So, mayors are just a sort of you know titular thing, whether they are elected or not elected. So, I think we should not go with this bandwagon. I mean, I hear this everywhere. Wherever I go, people say, look here, mayors are elected there for five years, but we, we don't even have a city government. In fact, the Chennai Municipal Commissioner said to me, I prefer to be called a Chennai local body. I'm not a Chennai city government because I don't have law and order. I don't have town planning. I don't have water. So I have a mayor who's directly elected, but he can't do anything. So that's the answer to that. Now to your question, uh, at one level, you know what you said about uh, rural votes more, it is, uh, uh, I don't know if you, uh, you must be uh, aware of also this uh, settlement commission, you know, for the, when the constituencies mm -hmm. of the legislators and members of parliament were redefined. Uh, at that time, 2008, you know, they played all the political parties came together and they did this mischief whereby when we went to election in 2014, only 20, it was on the basis of 28% of India being urban, 2001 census, and not even 31%. That 31% of 2011 census itself is an underestimate, as Patho yeah. says and as I say. We are actually close to 36, 37% even today. Right. Even though I formally, when I present, I say 33% because that's what the official data says. So that's there. Now, see, where I don't agree with you is first, I mean, this is something, you know, which drove me to write this book without a single international example. Because I yeah. said, I'm going to show how under Indian conditions, some cities mm. can transform some sectors yes. or some parts or uh, whatever. Hmm? Now, Singapore, I've now changed my mind. I think we can learn from other cities and, and states. And let me tell you what uh, I've just written. I've started my new column now as of last month. And that will be a, a monthly column looking at mm. some case study. And I'm going to go beyond India, you know, because I think there are lessons that we can learn. Mm. Now, Singapore, of course, was geographic. You know, everyone says they are rich, they are too disciplined. We are neither rich nor disciplined, so nothing that they do can be applicable to us. But when you look at what they've done, they've addressed their water challenge not by uh, 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 being rich and by uh, inventing new water or by desalination. That's only a very small part of their water solution. If you go and you actually go through an exhibition in Singapore on what their rivers were like, how much of wastewater was being treated, you know, what they were doing by importing water from Malaysia. 55% of their water was coming from Malaysia because they just didn't have other than salt water all around them. They, their slogan is catch every drop of rainwater that you possibly can and safely reclaim every drop of wastewater that you can. And they started with wastewater. So uh, they improved their catchment areas. You know, their mm. catchment area is this much, whereas we have a huge country, you know. So what we have done is by not uh, uh, treating our wastewater, by throwing our effluents into our river bodies and ground, we've polluted our soil and our river bodies and our catchment areas. That does not require uh, uh, you to be either very rich or to be very disciplined. You know, it requires behavioral change. And that is why I was delighted when the Prime Minister spoke from the ramparts of the Red Fort and said, clean India, because we really need to get this message across. Mm. The other day I was in New York and some people were saying that, you know, we will, you will find Indian homes mm. being swept three times a day. Mm. Hmm? But right outside, outside the yeah. home, you know, we will put the garbage. Because we don't understand. We don't understand how putting that garbage is connected with our health. 
And so, you know, I, I really don't think that, and also it may be, this is what the Indian politicians tell me, you know, when they say, but London didn't get it until such and such day, Tokyo didn't get it, but there were so many things that they didn't get, which we can get today. That's the whole point of technology and innovation. And I mean, I address the India Forum at MIT, and you know, the solutions that we have, are they, they are just so many and so easily implementable uh, but it's it's our politicians who first are not uh, uh, doing what they can to provide institutions of governance then we are not demanding transparency from them and when we do we get the results now delhi which is a city state has shaken them up both both national parties have been shaken shaken up and urban may be small, but urban has voice. And also they can, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not a politician, but uh, I mean, I'm not a political scientist, but from what I, whatever little I know as an economist of the political economy of India, if you have 50% of your population below the age of 25, and if you know that your working age population as percentage of the total is continuing to rise, it's above 62% today and is going to increase up to 2040. China has started a decline in 2010. Brazil will start in 2020. We go on till 2040 and even then we decline only moderately if you look at our demographic chart. So we are at that sweet spot in our demographic transition that if we don't empower our people uh, um, when they move from rural to urban areas, if we don't make our growth employment intensive, if we don't create the skills that are needed to match the demands as this growth takes place, of course we have a demographic disaster on hand. But we can convert this into a dividend if we do this. You are right that we have about 50% of our population still dependent on agriculture, but that is the failure of our industrialization process. And the states like Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh have already started a, a, a strategy of industrialization. And Madhya Pradesh is competing with Gujarat to get investments. All you need is this sort of competition between state governments to propel governments into industrializing and offering uh, uh, you know, opportunities for investment and you will see a much faster tra uh, transition. Mm -hmm. That would be my, have I answered all your, uh, mm -hmm. so you said when will we uh, reach the inflection point? You know, I would not be surprised if it comes in 10 years. And, and before that, given the numbers and given the absolute magnitude, you know, of uh, this uh, uh, urban population, it will already begin to show impact. I mean, I think in the next five years you will see much more. But in 10 years, what you call an inflection point, if I had to put a guess, I mean, that's all one can do. That's what I would say. 2024 will be a very urban-oriented election, is what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I got to learn a lot from this class. I'm a public health professional, <laughs> just with little bit idea about governance. I want to add something to what um, you told, sir. The political scenario you told for voting in India is agricultural and rural. That is a very valid point, because I had a very small opportunity to work in a district for like two years and I saw um, I had this one uh, incident with me where the population was demarcated as like some hundred and when we did the routine immunization campaign there more number of children were there than they have rated as the population of the whole village and I went to like the panchayat person I asked him how is that possible he told me because we get more money in funds showing that we don't have anything, rather than making it portray that we have this population and we can get access from governments or like from neighboring um, authorities, basically. So that's how they are functioning right now. They want to get safe water. They want to get the attention of people. And that's how they are 
trying to keep them some afloat to get more services of clean water and that village used to go like 2.5 kilometer to get one drop of safe water it was like that bad for that village so there is this constituencies for political voting issue which goes because then when the votes come they demand that we will get all the votes for you but then we should get some services for us that is like the topical field for them but i wanted to talk about something different you talked about service structure when we are going from rural to urban um i was just thinking about the way urbanization is working we are taking consideration of everything in it but are we considering health as a part of it too we talk about infrastructure we talk about how many number of phcs or chcs or health posts should be there but then we do not see how that how they will be monitored at what level they will be monitored because state does that most of thing and when state is taking care of health a lot of it is corruption issues and how people are elected how they come into it and i know i don't want to go into that corruption part of it because that will play its role Ma'am, in different you, issues yeah. what, is what, what is the question what is the question the is question it? is when we are talking about service structure going from agricultural where you have a phcs into a health post level how will that take a role how will well uh, let me put it this way um, uh, you know you said that um, i've not addressed health and you know one is curative health you know whether you have primary health centers and secondary health centers or whatever now i have not addressed that but what i am telling you is you can have as many health centers as you like but if you don't treat your wastewater and if you don't do your solid waste management you cannot solve the health problem and if you look at the industrialized countries when they were in our stage of development they invested in public health and in fact i remember it's very interesting that you should say so because 2 3 years ago uh when uh, i think dr manmohan singh was speaking from again this ramparts of the red fort and he mentioned something to the effect that you know we are going to spend x percent you know more on health and uh, uh, this a, a very enlightened you know official senior official of the government came very excited you know to me and said you know it's so good i said but you know what this does not deal with what i think comes even before health spending which is public health and that i i think we've neglected public health at least there you are talking about phc here but why not for me i mean but to me uh, um, you know we we spend so much on this integrated child development scheme we talk of food security and nutrition security we give them fortified biscuits we give them cooked meals and everything but then they drink contaminated water and all that nutrition is drained away and such a simple thing you cannot i mean you know i speak this at every seminar where because i do think that public health is directly connected with planning our uh, cities at least for rural areas you have national rural health scheme you have this scheme that's why they don't want to become urban but for urban the attitude is that the urban areas have richer people they don't need any of this and i think that delhi election mm. has really proved to them that people are fed up of all this now to give you why singapore is relevant for delhi uh, is that in delhi you have 50% of the households which are not connect, con- uh, connected through meters okay mm. and even those who are connected they don't always pay uh, the the bills for water and the new chief minister has announced that every household will get 20000 liters of drinking water free which means only 50% of the population 50% of the households because only they have meters and the other 50% who are not connected to the pipe network who are dependent on stand posts or uh, tankers their condition will become worse and this is uh, in fact i have said there that, that instead of doing the common sensical things you know what singapore did or which chennai did for rainwater harvesting to show an increase in groundwater uh this is harakiri you know when you can expect the water situation in delhi 
to go down mm -hmm. in months and years to come. So, you know, one doesn't have to say that you do the most technological or as they say, most smart thing. Mm. No, just do the commonsensical thing, which even our uh, ancestors knew what to do to give their children clean water. So Elon Musk is talking about grid defection, but Delhi has been practicing grid defection for the longest time. That's right. Well, that's a different <laughs> different grid defection. So I have a question about while the mic is passing over. Um, so, you know, arguably you said that the urban citizenry is vocal in response to Ashu's comment about the weight of political power being in the rural areas. Um, I would have thought that, um, you know, some well-meaning politician, I still assume that they exist, but well-meaning politician would have spent some time educating people about the importance of whatever pet issue is, clean water, public health, nutritional biscuits, take your pick. Um, uh, but that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. In fact, um, I, you know, from a few personal examples, I'm constantly dismayed at how often you find politicians preying on the ignorance of people hmm. and going the opposite direction. So let alone, you know, uh, proactively mobilizing the masses to do the right thing, in which case you might shift the outcome. Because I don't think you need huge electoral shifts on the margin to influence some of these decisions quite significantly. But would you agree with that characterization? Is that getting any better or worse? It, that uh, often it's uh, almost a venality that's expressed in going the other way. Um, and I don't know whether that's more true in urban India than in peri-urban India or rural India. So, No, that is a challenge. That is a problem. I mean, I would not deny that. But you know, what is happening now is with demonstration effect hmm. in small areas of how you know, you can actually bring about a virtuous circle, then you need communication. Mm. And I must say the much maligned media, mm. they do play uh, important uh, 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 an important role in, uh, you know, yeah. highlighting what's really not working and sometimes highlighting what is working. So I think we need to really build on all these civil society institutions. So, you know, here it was, it's a governance issue. I really do think it's not a funding issue. It's really more a governance issue. And if we force transparency and accountability, there will still be what you are saying, but, but it will become yeah. less. And uh, this is a long way, but uh, there is no short way. But it's interesting that you think that you'll see the results in four or five years. You, you, you know, that's, you know that's I do. Sure. No, yeah. I'll tell you why. Because when I uh, started my work on industrial stagnation mm. in India and I wrote uh, my first book mm. uh, um, in 1982, you know, highlighting all the man-made uh, um, sort of, you know, policies which were leading to poor productivity growth and industrial stagnation in India. I um, mean, I was pounced upon by, you know, those who believed uh, that this was because our worsening income distribution, there was no evidence of that. Mm. Those who believed it was because of agricultural drag, again, you know, data didn't show that. But anyway, at that time, if you had asked me, between 1982 when my book came out and 1991 when reforms were launched, Although during that period, more and more people were saying that. I was not the first one. And there were many official committees which were also mm. saying that there's something wrong with our policy regime. But still, if you had asked me that will we open up, I would have said no. Because, you know, the vested interest <laughs> just seemed so powerful and so heavy that I didn't think this change would bring about. What 1991 did was it started a process of opening up. It still took us 10 years before the private sector came on board mm -hmm. because for them uh, credibility had to be established that the reforms were there to stay. So while they were op openly they were saying yes yes we are for reforms but they were not really sure and not putting their money where their mouth is. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the private investment response it was really in 2001. And a lot of governments have come. It's not just one government. Mm. You had, beginning with the Congress government, you had a left of center United Front government, then you had a BJP government. And mm. of course, you had permutations and combinations of different political parties in different states when you had a coalition running the center. So if you could admittedly 
you needed a balance of payments crisis mm. to shake trigger up it, yeah. and, and trigger it. But there are some people who believe, and I'm one of those, mm. that even that would not have brought about the reform unless you really had the breakup of the Soviet Union. Because, you know, up to 1991, we used to talk about the consequences of uh, reforms in Eastern Europe and China and, you know, what was happening. But we felt that this couldn't happen to us. When Soviet Union broke up, you really saw the consequences of inaction. So you began to think, well, I mean, and then came the balance of payments crisis. After that, what has happened is you have a whole generation of people. And Tarun, I mm. address convocations mm. in uh, um, India in several universities I've been. And, you know, these kids, are they've never seen 5% growth. They've grown <laughs> up with accelerating growth and they will take, they'll settle for nothing less. Mm. And they regard the world as their marketplace. They're so confident. Yeah. So if we have now seen the result of that. We can no longer say that India cannot grow at more than 5.5%. So now it's going to be more difficult to fool those people. I agree, you know, that uh, politicians, there are some politicians will always be there to play those games. But I really do think it is that which tells me that this is a very different India from India of 1980. And if we have come this far, I think the next phase will be much faster, much faster. Uh, Ma yeah. Great. Thank you so much. My name is Sharmila Murthy. I'm a professor at Suffolk Law in downtown Boston and also a visiting scholar at the Kennedy School. And it's such an honor to hear from you because I was looking at your work with the High Powered Commission in a recent article I finished that was analyzing the implications of the 74th Amendment, uh, the JNMURM, and the impediments to decentralization. And it was great to hear um, your perspective on the, the different barriers. One uh, insight that I, that I had when I was doing my research, and I'd like to ask whether or not this resonates with you, is that India is the most centralized federal country in the world. It has this rhetoric of decentralization. It's taken the steps with the 74th Amendment. But in fact, it is highly centralized in terms of politically, administratively, fiscally, as you pointed out. And that in many ways, there was a huge tension with the states. You mentioned that there's a handful of states that are, in fact, very powerful. But if you even look at the history of the 74th Amendment, many states felt that it was, in fact, a ploy to de mm -hmm. disempower mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. and, in fact, empower mm -hmm. the um, the local bodies at their mm. expense. And when you, mm. I mean, it's sort of ironic mm. that it has taken this massive central scheme to actually try and implement these reforms mm. at the local level. And even the, fi I mean, the states don't even have a lot of fiscal power. Most of the money is coming from the central government and allocated down. So my question is, is, um, is that an accurate uh, statement that one of the real challenges is that the way in which these efforts at decentralization have happened is that the states have in fact been bypassed. They're not partners. So in your mind, what does effective cooperative federalism with the states really mean? So that would, I would love your response mm -hmm. to that. And then a second question that's um, a little shorter is just slums. So mm -hmm. the huge legal barriers that slum dwellers face to even gaining access to legal services, and even when you have schemes like Ray, which was folded into the JNMURM mm -hmm. that said, regardless of legality, people can get access to basic services. You know, municipalities mm -hmm. don't want to do it unless you know slums mm -hmm. are have mm -hmm. the official status by the states. Um, you have this whole sort of conundrum, and I would love your your insights on that as well. Thank yeah. you. Very good questions, um, and you know. I would agree that we have, uh, uh, we have had a centralized federal framework, but what I was trying to convey is that that is changing big time. And uh, in the last, um, I would say in the last 10 years itself, the states feel uh, much more empowered Partly also because the uh, government of India has been run by coalitions, and these coalitions have been supported by strong regional parties, and that, you know, was the first level at which they felt that you know they had a power uh, uh, to influence things uh, at the centre. But I think with growth happening 
at the pace at which it has and is expected to accelerate, there is just, you know, market is a very decentralizing uh, phenomenon, right? So um, the logic of uh, uh, deregulation <coughs> was that, you know, you will have greater powers to the state governments. Uh, and that has happened. Um, and they, you are absolutely right that they are reluctant to part. This is what I was telling you. One fact that uh, this time around, the 14th Central Finance Commission has actually, uh, you, know, you mentioned, you said the fiscal powers are concentrated. You know, actually there is uh, this uh, uh, basic rule about efficiency of tax collection mm. and, and then its uh, distribution. So um, at one level, I think customs revenue used to go to the government of India. I think it was in the 80s it was decided that that will be part of the pool which is shared with the states. And in the 14th Finance Commission, they have actually uh, uh, made 40% of the divisible pool of revenue to be given automatically transferred to the state governments. Now, this is actually not an increase in the money that they used to get, but they now get it in an automatic manner. Whereas earlier on, it used to come through mm -hmm. schemes like Sarva Shiksha Abhyan or Rural Health Scheme. So now, they, it's going to be very difficult for the government of India to influence the state governments to do clean India mm -hmm. or whatever, because they've themselves given up the levers through which they could actually egg them on. And it is because of that that I'm saying that states are much more empowered today than they were. And uh, if you look at the Indian federal setup, now again, you know, I'm not an expert on that. I'm just a, an economist, but I, I'm saying these things from my ground level insights that I pick up, spending a lot of time with deputy municipal commissioners and local level officials and principal secretaries, urban development, and you know, so these are insights picked up from there. The action is really in the states, and uh, there's no question today that we are a much more federal uh, 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 structure than we were even, say, 10 years ago. Hmm? And the real uh, uh, challenge uh, uh, that we are going to face between now and the next 10 years is that the cities are demanding their place. And you know, one of the things that people talk about is that at least take Mumbai out of Maharashtra. Mm. But then what will the chief minister of Maharashtra do? But you know what? I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Mm. When I travel to Pune, which is the second mm -hmm. largest city there is no comparison between Mumbai and Pune. Pune <laughs> looks like a Mufassil town, you know? <laughs> so you really, uh, you need to get these chief ministers out <laughs> of there and have somebody else worrying about Pune and uh, Malkapur and you know, what have you. That will not be easy, but the cities are now clamoring for uh, the, the autonomy, the power to do what their people demand of them. And your second question was slums. Yeah, I'm glad you asked me that question. <laughs> because, you know, um, about 25 to 27% of our urban population lives in slums. And that's an underestimate because that's an average. If you look at the real mega cities, it's much, much more. In uh, Mumbai, it's over 50%. Now, the way I address the challenge of slums is that uh, in our report also we said that the uh, norms for urban service delivery mm. should be applicable to one and all. Mm? So if I want my solid waste to be managed, to be transported, transferred, managed, processed and dumped in a landfill in a scientific manner, I want the same to be done to the garbage from the slums. And, and the way I put it to uh, you know, officials and people and politicians when I talk to them is that unless you do that, my health is not secure. So mm -hmm. it is in our self-interest to stop saying that you are a notified or unnotified or registered or unregistered slum. Well, if you got here and we don't have the Chinese system of shutting you off through big gates, 
then we have to provide uh, for the services. The second question is that of shelter. Now, you know, it's not only the poor who live in slums. Even not so poor live in slums. And that has to do with our distorted housing policy and our land policy. So on that, I say I have moved from being an economist studying industrial growth and productivity and employment to service delivery in urban areas and what governance structures are needed. And that requires enough learning for me to stay with this. So I don't want to get involved in the discourse on how to rehabilitate slums. That should be somebody else's job. But I am saying that slums should have the same service delivery as I do. And, and I have seen this happen in, uh, in the south, in um, which was the city. Um, um, there are three cities in Karnataka, um, Gulbarga, um, the name escapes not me Bangalore. now. Hmm? No, not Bangalore. It's um, um, Gul Gulbarga and there are two other cities mm -hmm. which we visited where they had taken 40% of the city with public-private partnership. They give continuous water. And, you know, the slums, Hubli, Hubli, Dharwar and Gulbarga. And, you know, I, I visited those slums and, you, you know, outside of their homes, they had this tap mm -hmm. and they opened the tap and, you know, with full pressure, the water is coming. And I told them, you know what, even I don't get it. So it's, <laughs> uh, it's a nice year. But we, we need to do that. So there's no question about it. Uh, we only have uh, yeah. six, seven minutes. So let's take two, three questions. If you could just be succinct and say who you are and uh, uh, short questions. Yeah. Hi, my name is Karan Bhagat. And um, I have a question. And I'm an engineer as well as an entrepreneur at a company in Boston. So my question is, you know, given the local government is kind of held back because of the state government's um, mm -hmm. empowerment, what effect do you think it's going to have on the public, oh, sorry, on the private sector and young entrepreneurs contributing towards this urbanization and smart city development? I'm Tarun Singhal. I'm a neurologist. I'm a physician. I trained at Ames for nine years before coming to States in 2006. Uh, so uh, I just have a comment, actually. I think curative health as well as preventative health both have to go uh, side by side. Yes. Uh, it's just like you know developing ISRO at the time mm. of mm -hmm. independence, along with you know helping people get food. Mm. So. No, absolutely. No, 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 no. I'm not uh, saying that curative health is not necessary. I'm just saying we've completely neglected public health. You know. Uh, we have like a lot of examples you talk about in books and all, but I feel generally a lot of people want to do some change, but they don't get how to do that mm. because they are very solitary and they are in the community where they're talked about. They're not in general public. So there should be some way that people who want to know about solar energy or want to know about water harvesting, they can easily do what they can do at their home. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. Just one mm -hmm. last one here, and then you can address whichever subset you wish. Yeah. Uh, my name is Parmesh Karimela. Uh, I'm just an enthusiast, an enthusiast in India's development. Uh, my question is, uh, I think you have talked about uh, the focus being on the rural uh, electorate because of the whatever reasons. Uh, one comment is that, first of all, I think if you look at the per capita income of urban residents versus rural residents, <coughs> rural is probably one-fourth of the urban, or somewhere in that range. So shouldn't that be the case that at this stage we should be focusing so that because you have to lift the bottom and not just the from the top, that is one. And in terms of the cities, shouldn't the resources also come from the people rather than just the investment from the government or whatever other sources? Like in terms of people, in terms of the money that people pay, like property tax and other um, sort of uh, services, it's very low. People are not willing to pay also. Once they get the services, they'll, they'll be willing to pay. So it should be the responsibility of the urban consumers also to contribute to, towards the development and not just getting the funds from outside. Yeah. Okay. okay, let Thank me you. start with the last question. You know, today, this was the case some years ago. Now what has happened is that because the quality of service delivery is very poor and you are not charging for that, it's a chicken and egg problem, you know. Uh, but today what has happened is people are so fed up with the uh, uh, non-availability of services and poor quality of services that they are saying, 
you please charge us. We are willing to pay, but give us the service. And there is no willingness to charge because politicians are in the game of sort of playing populist uh, things. So th that I think that things have changed uh, in, in that respect. Now resources, of course, the resources that the government spends also are resources that come from people. So you know, people in in Bangalore they found when they did self assessment of property taxes actually the compliance increased because people were saying so long as you won't harass us we will do our assessment and then you can do 25 percent checks they had, it was a very uh, carefully uh, uh, prepared scheme that Bangalore put in practice and it shows that it works uh, whereas in Delhi uh, they said they were doing property tax reform there's no no improvement so this this is the reality of it now the uh, other question was the uh, yeah, rural uh, urban per capita income. See, uh, in the last, I don't know whether it's 10 years or five years, I'm forgetting that now, but the actual gap between the rural and urban wage has become smaller. In the last few years? Last, yes, last, I think even 10 Since years. Gone, so Since 2005. So, uh, so, 2000, so that's about 10 years, that gap has gone. Um, but th there was another point here that I wanted to make, the way you had put rural urban um, per capita income. The gap has, um, hmm, it escapes me. There was something else connected with your question that I wanted to say. If it comes back, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. The, um, uh, yeah, on how people uh, uh, know, you know, what, what they can do. You know, actually there are many, many initiatives that are coming up in the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there, uh, we, from my uh, institute, um, we have been doing uh, every second month a workshop in some city or the other, where um, out of the 14 workshops that we've done, uh, in eight of them, the chief ministers have come for one session. There is that much interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we get people, uh, we get experts, we get civil society, we get uh, uh, you know, officials. Normally, uh, the, it's only the chief minister or the urban development minister who comes. And what we do is um, we get best practices. For example, in Kerala, the chief secretary called me and said, please bring a workshop on solid waste management because it is my number one headache. Uh, uh, he had just joined as chief secretary and he says that garbage movement has stopped in the city of Trivandrum because the villages surrounding the city are not allowing them to dump, which is what they did earlier on. So uh, so I, I took a, a, a resource person from BRAC who had set up biomethanation plants and I, I got Dr. Kasturi Rangan because you know he knew about waste to energy alternatives. I got some people who would set up public-private partnerships in incineration, gasification. And, but you know, the problem is not technology. The problem, again, it ends up being, you know, technology confuses. And when you don't know, you think they're talking big things. But when you really understand, it's all about burning uh, uh, this uh, waste at very high temperature and ensuring that the toxic gases don't get out. Now, you know, this is no rocket science. Why is it not happening? And we discussed that. So um, we had people from Pune coming and saying what they were doing. So there's a lot of sharing. Um, at the National Institute of Urban Affairs, they have a program called PEARL, which is also about sharing best practices in municipalities. Um, there's much more writing on these issues today than when I had started in 2010. Yeah. I mean, I remember the chief minister of Assam uh, uh, um, met me somewhere in Delhi and told me that he had read my article on Pune. He visited Pune to see their biomethanation plants and he said, you'll be happy to know we have three biomethanation plants. Now, I mean, that was music to my ears because you don't think that things actually happen. But there are many, many, many more people who are doing that. So I think this has begun on your question about the private sector. You see, the public-private partnership today is getting a very bad name because uh, when we had these public-private partnerships, they 
had to be based on some sort of a revenue model because the private sector is not entering into this arrangement out of altruism, right? They want a return. So you need to agree on what the char user charges will be, what the tipping fee will be. You need to have risk assignment. So if there is you know, something that happens, who's bearing that risk? You need to have a dispute settlement mechanism so that when you have a problem, but there were two problems. One was all these things were not done properly, but an underlying problem is that twofold. One is that the basic trust between the public sector and the private sector is missing. So when they enter into a public-private partnership, it is very much outsourcing. Mm -hmm. And then they, the, the minute something goes wrong, they want to wash their hands off and leave uh, the partner there. And the second thing is that there is no capacity at the local government level to enter into an agreement. So on the one hand, you have qualified people like her uh, and financial restructurers and lawyers and all who come and say how they will, they see it all here, how it will be done. And on the other side, you have half an accountant, a quarter of a lawyer, and you know, no engineer, nobody. How can you have partnership, you know? So you need to, I think capacity building and you know, we often talk about building capacity at the local government level. Believe me, no, no, you need area. to build capacity all the way up to the government of India level. And one reason why people like us are a little bit more effective in dealing with state governments and local governments through my institute that we've been doing is because when we go there, even though the chief secretary may have called me saying, bring a thing, my first announcement to this group of municipal fellows, we normally have about 100 or so, is that you know I want you to know, we call this a knowledge dissemination and capacity building workshop. It is as much building our capacity as yours. Because you're on the ground and you know what challenges you face, you tell us. And government of India doesn't talk like that, even to state governments, let alone local governments. So we need to change that culture. And it will come because people are now getting feeling empowered. It will come, Actually, but it will take time. The last time. point could apply to Harvard also. <laughs> 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 On that uh, optimistic note, uh, thank, thank you. you. It's really thank sweet you. of you to spend all thank this time with us.